if they if it's there in the record, why not? Good morning. Can we have you stand and join us in worship this morning? I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me I can only imagine surrounded by your glory what will my heart feel will I dance for you Jesus or in all of you be still will I stand in your presence to my knees I'll be able to speak it all I can only imagine I can only imagine I can only imagine When that day comes And I find myself Standing in the sun I can only imagine When all I will do Forever, forever worship you. I can only imagine. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? To my knees. I can only imagine, I can only imagine, when all I will do is forever, forever worship you, I can only imagine. today. So if you want to follow along and then uh, sing along if you know it, it's on the radio a little bit. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay Oh, I will see of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all 
my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able oh I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice you've led me through the fire and in darkest night you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God and all my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so so the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Yes, I will sing of the goodness of God Good morning, everyone. Good to be in the house of the Lord. You may be seated. All right. Let's open in a word of prayer. Almighty God, we thank you that we can gather in your house today and that we can worship you in spirit and in truth. We ask, Lord, that you would uh, bless this service and uh, and take our minds captive, that we might not be distracted by any other thoughts that are in our lives and in our world, Lord, but that we might totally devote our thought this morning to you, that you might minister to us. Challenge us, Lord, where we need to make things right and to make corrections in our life. Encourage us where we need to encourage, be encouraged. Help us to encourage one another and help us to walk in the light as you are in the light. And we'll commit this day and this service and this time unto you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we want to remember this morning in prayer Bob Hawk, and we're going to take a moment and pray for him as well this morning. Um, he is recovering from triple bypass surgery, which took place Friday. Um, and Pastor received a text this morning that he is having some difficulties. So we're going to pray for Bob, and one floor beneath Bob is Hallie Condon, who is also um, in, in bad shape with his heart. So um, we're going to take time, take a minute, and pray for both those gentlemen, um, and they are missed here this morning. So let's pray. Lord, we lift up our brother Bob this morning to you, and we pray, Lord, as he's recovering and, and, um, and having some struggles here, we just pray, Lord, that you would have your hand upon him and heal his body, we would ask. And we ask for special comfort to Lenny and Bridget and family there. And Lord, we ask for a quick recovery. We think of our brother Howie as well, one floor below Bob. And we know that his heart is, is functioning very little. And so we ask, Lord, for your mercy upon, upon Howie as, as his uh, heart struggles to beat. And so um, we pray for Linda as well, that you might comfort her for their children and grandchildren. And uh, we just lift these men up before you now in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Our reading this morning is taken from Matthew as we continue our um, 
subject, which is the, the Beatitudes, and we're going to move this morning to verse 9, but I will read the passage of Matthew chapter 5 down to verse 9 this morning. It says, Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Well, we're going to begin to do something a little bit different uh, for our mission moment. And I'm going to kick this off, and maybe the Lord will prick your heart to want to do this. And if, you, if he does, uh, you make it known to us. But, you know, we're, we're coming back together. And uh, one of the, the verses that has stood out to me in recent days and I began to teach this in Sunday school as we came back together, was Hebrews 10.25, and it says, Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, where is it in the habit of some, but to, but to assemble yourselves and to, and to, as you see the day approaching. The day approaching Christ's return may be very imminent. Certainly, all the things happening in the world and the rise of evil in the world Makes our, makes our eyes and our hearts and our minds turn to the things that the Bible says will happen. And many of those are happening. Did you realize today that China is nearly a totally cashless society? And that people can be identified by, by identification on a, on a cell phone? Something stood out to me recently that China is now being referred to as the beast. Isn't that interesting? Um, and the world is being swept away with one lie after another. It's, it's amazing to, to see this happen, to see it happening so quickly. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. So we, we began a, 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 a series in Sunday school, which I planned to do in one, maybe two lessons that has turned into four. I, I don't know where we're going with it after this. But it just, it, it, it's something that was on my heart. People have been attending, and, and it's been, been very good. So in, in conversation on Tuesday night at our, after our elder meeting, uh, Pastor and Chris, and I, and I think it was Chris' suggestion, that maybe we need to just reintroduce one another to, our, to ourselves. We've been apart. And you may not know what's going on in one another's lives. And part, part of, of when we take mission moment, this church is a mission within itself. You follow me? We encourage one another in the faith. We lift one another up. And, and all of us have a story and a story to tell. So I'm going to ask my wife to come up. We're just going to introduce ourselves and, um, and tell you what's going on, a little bit about our family. And you'll have that opportunity too. It gets us reunited. You follow me? So I'm going to break the ice, and, I may, and you'll probably do a better job because you can, you can go off of what we're going to bumble here, okay? So my name's Dave Morris. <laughs> I'm happy to meet all of you, okay? I, I've been the chairman of the elder board here for quite a while. That's my role here in the church. The church has been our lives. We're, we have been married 35 years. <laughs> Soon to be 36. Third, soon to be 35. I don't even know how old I am. I, I, we had a birthday party. My birthday's in January. I thought I was celebrating my 56th. I'm celebrating 57, right? Okay. It doesn't matter to me, so, you know, I, didn't, I lost track. Um, I, I tell you that to say a little bit of our history. Um, Jill grew up in this area in Stillwater, uh, is where her parents live, over there. They have a farm. Farm's been in the family since 1808, um, and so this is her home territory. I grew up in Lancaster County. Jill uh, went to Lancaster Bible College. While finishing up at Lancaster Bible College, we met at a, 
at, at a restaurant. So, um, and so that part of our, our story is history. We moved back to this area in 1993 uh, when our son William was born. And uh, we got acquainted here at the church over when it was at Jersey Town and so have been here ever since. Um, and so we've, we've found ourselves in different roles in the church throughout the years. I make my living as a, as a cabinet maker doing woodworking. This became my life verse when I was very young. Um, I dedicated my life to the Lord when I was 11. I went forward in, a, in an evangelistic revival meeting at our, at our church and although as a child I had trusted the Lord many times as, a save, as, for, as my Savior, I don't think I truly understood what that was until one night we had uh, a message that really stirred my heart. And there was, a, there was an invitation given to come forward. You know, we don't do that very often anymore, but in the 70s that was very popular. And I don't know how I got from there to there, but I was there. And, and at that moment, and from that point on, I knew that I had passed from death to life. And I had a confidence that God had saved me. God gave me an ability to make things. And ever since I was a little kid, I was making things constantly, building, working with my hands. And he led me to this verse, and it's kind of been a life verse. It says, to make your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your hands. That's been my life. Lead a quiet life, mind your own business, work with your hands, support yourself by, by the, whatever talent or gift God has given you. Just as we told you that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders so that you will, you will not be dependent upon anybody purpose that God has given us to place us in different, different circles of people that we might be a testimony and that they might see that there is something different about us. In my, my interest has always been American history. I love it. I, and, and so it took me with that talent and the interest in that to doing historical things. And God has allowed me to do some pretty neat things for some museums, including um, the James Madison's home and doing some fun things like that and it takes you and I, I don't I don't mean that as a personal boast that's just where God has taken me to do different things and it and it leads you in a realm of people that may not darken the door of any church or that may be Christians outside of your own fellowship that you are encouraged with I, I, I developed a good friend in West Virginia and here a, a um, just about two years ago, I cut my foot very seriously at a historic event, and they had to call an ambulance. And I was like, don't call an ambulance. Please don't call an ambulance. I can't pay for that. Um, and my good friend Tim came up to me, and he said, you don't know who you need to minister to today. Get in the ambulance. And sometimes we need friends like that, don't we? Um, so that's... That's who we are. We have two children. Our son, William, um, is the oldest. He's going to be 29, 28, 28. And he, he has studied very hard to be an architect. He went to Lancaster Bible College, became very enamored with church architecture, acoustics done back in the old days when before they had these, all kinds of fascinating stuff. He has a talent, and he pursued that at... at, at uh, Judson University, he's gotten, um, he's one test away from having his license as an architect and um, is doing very well. Lives in Christiana, PA, which is, if you know, uh, in Lancaster County, a little south of Gap is a little town about the size of Millville called Christiana, and he bought a home there. He and his wife Anna live there. They have, have a daughter. She's 18 months old, Elizabeth, and uh, he's doing very well, very active at Providence Bible Church. And they, they have Bible studies, Bible studies in their home. And Anna uh, heads up a children's ministry there. There's over 200 children, it's a full-time position. Um, and is doing well with that. 
Our youngest, younger son, Benjamin, is in the Pocono area. He married a girl that her dad manages a retreat center, Christian retreat center in the Pocono area. And so that took him out there and he runs a contracting business and has done work for some of you. So, um, and doing very well. They, they have been skipping around churches and in this past to find one that they feel at home in out there. It's been difficult. Um, they're trying out a new church this morning, but with all the shutdowns and all the restrictions, it's been a difficult year for them. They have two twin boys, uh, Ethan and Carson, and they're about 20 months old. Um, and they are characters. Um, we're going to go see them as soon as church is over. So a little bit of an update uh, with our lives. We've like everybody else, managing through the coronavirus, missing all of you. So I'm gonna let my wife just share a couple words and then we're all done. Hello, that's one. <laughs> um, as Davis said, I'm more from the Benton area than from here, but I came to know the Lord at age 10. And again, it was similar at, it was in the 70s and when we had a lot of evangelistic meetings. And it was a process. I remember going forward it, with just our own pastor to the altar and then a few months later doing it again. And I think it was just that process of totally understanding that um, and then went on to Lancaster Bible College and then I was in the Lancaster area for 14 years before we moved back. As Dave said that um, we have a family farm and I'm an only child and so when I had, when we knew we were going to have children, I wanted to move back home so that my parents could be close to grandchildren. So prior to us actually living here, we bought a house in Jersey Town and had that for three years before we even moved into it. We rented it for a while. And in that course of time, as he said, we went to um, Jersey Town, there the church, and that's how we met the Wylings because the Wylings were our neighbors in Jersey Town. We bought homes at the same time. and. They were expecting the twins at that time. And so that was kind of interesting because they didn't know, well, I believe she had known the Lord, but John did not, and they were away from God and all that. <coughs> but it was neat that we got to be friends with them during that time, and then our past then again met through the church uh, years later. So that was an interesting thing. Um, but going on, we moved back home, and it's been, for me, moved back home. And it was couple of things brought us back. I wanted to be here, but Dave wanted to be um, self-employed, and it was not economical for us to stay in Lancaster County for Dave to be in business for himself because I wanted to be an at-home mom. I am a teacher by profession. I had taught nine years prior to us having uh, William, and watching the effects as a teacher of moms and dads both working and kids at that time, they called them latchkey kids that they would get home before the parents did and would have a key and would go in the house and go through the procedure of calling the parents and you know, whatever. And, and kids then not getting homework done and being tired or j just the whole life of not having a parent at home with them. And I wasn't gonna do that. I just saw the effects of that and I was committed. I was older, I was just about 32 till I had William. And so I was starting out later in life, as some people have with children here, and uh, I wanted, I didn't want to miss any of it. And we decided as um, a couple, we were going to homeschool, which we did. Um, I, William was our eager learner, and um, it was easy to do. William had, or Benjamin had his many challenges academically, and, but we, with God's help, persevered. It was a year by year. Uh, battle for some of it and other parts of it was not but I don't regret it at all That's good. all right so who's next think about it and let us know we'll probably go through our our elder board and our deacon board and and uh, and then to you so pastor we do want to have the offering uh, Heavenly 
again, Father, we want to thank you for the opportunity to serve you. We want to thank you for what you've done in our lives, and we want to praise you for what you will do in our lives. Let us just turn this day towards you, Lord, and turn our lives and our hearts towards you as well. In your name we pray. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father. Again, we want to welcome everyone who's coming out today, doing things a little different, get, trying to get back on our regular schedule, and, and uh, it's always good. The, um, the series that we're doing is encouraging to me because it's, it, it's really... Uh, relevant for what, what we're going through in our world today and I'm just reassured every every time I'm studying that that it's exactly what God wants me to preach Sunday school today was <laughs> kind of a introduction to what I want to share with you this morning I didn't talk to David I had no idea what he was doing and the Lord's just putting it all together the series is called Blessed Kingdom Living. We're up to the seventh beatitude. And that is, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. And wow, what a time to talk about peace. <laughs> the idea of peace dominates the whole Bible, and it opens with peace in the Garden of Eden, and then it closes with peace in eternity. And in fact, you could chart the course of, of biblical history by the peace theme, man's sin, being deceived by the devil, interrupted peace in the garden. But at the cross, Christ became our peace. And because he has provided peace, there can be peace in the heart of a man and woman a man or a woman, if, when they come to know Christ as their personal Savior, someday Jesus will come again and his title will be fulfilled. That title is what? The Prince of Peace. He will establish his eternal kingdom of peace. Peace on earth. In the Bible, there's, there are 400 references to peace and peace. This morning, we're going to go over each one of those. No. But God calls himself the God of peace. There's several passages where his, his reference is that he is the God of peace. But there is no peace in the world. That last phrase is true. There's no peace in the world for two reasons. One is because of the, opposi the opposition of Satan. And two... Following that, the disobedience of man. That's why there's no peace. The fall of some of the angels and the fall of man has caused the world to, to live in a world without peace. Peace. 
as long as they are without peace, there will be no true peace in this world. Now we come to the seventh beatitude. It's like the seventh step in this progressive ladder of living the, ble- the life of a blessed kingdom living, which we see here translated not just blessed, but happy, happiness. It almost seems that God has called us to restore and to experience something lost since the fall. What was lost? Peace. And it seems we are to restore this world to the peace that was forfeited by our sinning. A special people whom God has called as peacemakers are to become his agents in the world. And they are here to go before us as a mission until Jesus comes. And it kind of falls right in line with this blessed kingdom living, doesn't it? Uh, To live the, the life so that the world can see it. They'll go far beyond this world's idea of peace, like the Nobel Peace Prize, you know? How many people have gotten that? And the reason they'll go far beyond is because the peace that, 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 that will be offered is God's peace, not man's peace. And it'll be eternal, it'll last forever. It's, it's divine peace. It is real peace. And Jesus says God has promised to bless people who are his agents for peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, even calling them sons of God. The world peacemakers, (laughs) as we look at history, they have a terrible record. I I appreciate David and, and Jill's testimony today. David is our Christian historian. And he is very quick to, to remind us of our history, and that is good. We need to be reminded because uh, others are trying to destroy that history. But now we come to the seventh beatitude here. Blessed are the peacemakers. The seventh step in this progressive ladder that ascends to being, to living, blessed kingdom living. It almost seems that God has called us to restore and experience something that's, that was lost in the garden by the fall. It seems that we are to restore the, this world to the peace that was forfeited by our sinning. There are groups that are saying that's going to happen, that, that we are, are God's people and we are to do that. But I want you to understand it better this morning from the word of God of what our role is in being peacemakers. The world's peacemakers are not actually peacemakers, they're actually peacekeepers. And there's a difference. But as I dove into this seventh beatitude, I found out that I can't do it in one sitting. I'm going to have to just give you an introduction today because it's very important. It seems like one beatitude builds on the next, right from the first to to now. The peace we hail today begins to collapse tomorrow. Have you seen that? How many administrations have we gone through that try to declare a peacekeeping treaty for Israel? How many have done that, shook hands, did the whole thing between the Arabs and and, and Israel? In our our lifetime, several. Because we don't have political peace. We don't have economic peace. We don't have social peace. As a counselor, I deal with domestic peace, (laughs) and we don't have domestic peace in the homes, do we? We have peace nowhere because we have no peace in our hearts. That's the real issue, isn't it? 
Someone has said that Washington, D.C., it has a lot, it, it has lots of peace monuments. Well, the reason is because there's lots of wars. <laughs> peace is merely the brief, glorious moment in history when everybody stops to reload. <laughs> the world was, con was concerned after the aftermath of World War II. And so what did the world do in 1945? They, they, they formed what's called the United Nations. And, and it was brought into existence with the motto, the motto was to have succeeding generations free from the scourge of war. Why? Because the world was sick of war. Well, since that time, there has not been one day of peace on earth. Not one day. It's a pipe dream. Good intentions, but a pipe dream. There's no peace. We have no ability to get along with each other. I mean, look at us as a church. We have the Prince of Peace as our Savior, and God has given us his peace, and we are to live in that peace. But you know what? We still, even as believers, <laughs> we have relational problems with one another. Huh? They come up. And if that's the way it is with God's people, why would you expect any different in the world? We have no ability to get along with each other. Every relationship is fragile. You think, oh no, it's wonderful, it'll always be good. No, people are very fickle. It changes. People have mental and emotional illnesses as never before. I overheard someone talking the other day about uh, school teaching, and, and uh, I was just listening. You know, I wasn't eavesdropping, but I couldn't help but to hear. And, and many are leaving our institutions of education because, I didn't hear this from them, but I, heard, but I know this is a fact, because of how hard it is to teach, especially in our public schools. There are families, break, breakups that, 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 that are related to that. There's disorder in, in the schools because of these poor kids that, that, that are coming in. There's problems even in the marketplace like that's never been before in our history. So it's not just schools, but it's, but it's family, schools, it's, it's life itself today. Seems to be no end to it. Man has no peace in himself, so, so this, so his world, this world that we live in is merely a projection of ourselves riddled with chaos. Amen? Come on, let's pray. Father, bless the word today. As we look into your scriptures and we look into these Beatitudes, we see this blessed kingdom living that you are presenting to your people. And Lord, for those who will listen in, that maybe not, they're not sure if they're your people, but that they will listen and hear what Jesus has to say, I pray that you'll work in each heart and bless the message, bless the word in Jesus' name, amen. This is a wonderful verse of scripture. Matthew 5, verse 9, is a wonderful verse of scripture to look at. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. I said, Blessed means happy in, 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 in the Greek, and, and happy are the peacemakers. Happy are those that are, are called to be the healers. Peacemakers are healers. And what I want to give you this morning is, I, want to, I was going to give you two, but I'm only going to give you one. I'm going to give you the meaning of, of what this peace is that we're talking about. I watch commercials a lot. I, I don't like to watch some movies, but I watch news, and I watch not very much news, but I watch a lot of golf. And I, and I, got, and, and I like hunting things, too. But anyway, I, and I see these commercials. Once in a while, you see a commercial about a car, and it shows some fancy car, and they're on a trip, and they go somewhere, and everybody jumps out, and they're running to the 
lake and they're getting all their things out and they slam the door and the wife, the wife, she just locks the doors and stays in the car. And she sits there like, and they're there, come on, come on, come on. And she's there, just wait. I'll be, I'll be over there. What's she doing? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> she's enjoying the moment. But that's all the world looks at as the meaning of peace. The meaning of peace from the world's perspective is the absence of conflict and strife. And what I want to give you this morning is I want to give you God's meaning from the scriptures of what God's peace is all about. We've talked about this. We share that with people. We, they say, how can you live? How can you be a pastor and go through all the problems that, you're, that you get from people and still have peace? How can you do it? Well, I lock the door and shut everybody. No. No, that's not how you do it. What I'm going to show you this morning is not a secret, but it is an eye-opener because it's not the world's definition of peace. Some people define peace as the absence of conflict and strife. No conflict or strife exists in a cemetery. As a matter of fact, you might see a little epithet that says, what, rest in peace. <laughs> but we don't look to the cemeteries for our model of God's peace. We look to the word of God, and God sees it. Peace is far more than the absence of something. It is actually the presence of something, and that's what I want to give you this morning. It's the presence of righteousness, purity, and truth. And you're going, whoa, what? That's the definition? That's the meaning of peace, of God's peace? Yes, it is. Right from the word of God. And I'm going to explain it to you now. The first, the first word is righteousness. And only righteousness can produce the relationship that brings two parties together. Noah was called the preacher of righteousness. And if you know from 2 second, second Peter 2 5, Peter refers to Noah as the preacher of righteousness from, from Genesis chapter 6 and the whole story of the world in that day and age. It says that the world was evil continuously. The hearts of men were evil continuously. And it's starting to look like that today, isn't it? As we look at the world and, and where we are. And taking evil and saying it's good and good is evil. I mean, it's constantly evil. And so there you have this faithful guy who is led by God to preach, and he preaches judgment and repentance to a world that desperately needs to repent of their sin. And Noah does it for 120 years, as God had instructed him to build an ark in a desert area and build it, and as you're building it, witness and preach righteousness to an ungodly world who will reject you anyway. He didn't, he didn't say that, but Noah was the testimony for 120 years. So it wasn't just a drop in the hat that the world had an opportunity to repent and, and respond to Noah's preaching of righteousness. That's an example of, 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 of becoming a, a peacemaker. Men can stop fighting without righteousness. We have a whole history of the world, but they cannot live peaceably without righteousness. Righteousness, not only, it not only puts an end to harm, but it administers, it administers the healing love that brings people together. God's peace not only stops war, but replaces it. It replaces it with the righteousness that brings harmony and true well-being one to another. Elijah is another example. Elijah was, was the prophet, and he was the prayer warrior of righteousness. You remember what James said about, about Elijah? 
Elijah was, was the one, his prayer was described as effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man, which availeth much. If you know Elijah, you know he was the one that <laughs> got in trouble with Jezebel because you know what? He had to speak the truth. And he did. He did it in love. Oh, they wanted to kill him for it. Righteousness calls us right relationship. Peace is not just stopping war. Peace is creating righteousness that brings enemies together in love. When one of the Jewish faith says to another of the Jewish faith, what do they say in their greeting? They say, Shalom. Shalom, God's peace. But you know what shalom means to the Hebrew? It doesn't mean may you have no war. (laughs) What peace means to the Hebrew is that may you have all the righteousness and goodness God can give you. Shalom. There's a big difference between a truce and peace. The truce, the peace treaty, just says that you don't shoot for a while Peace comes when the truth is known, the issues are settled, and the parties are embraced, where they embrace each other in forgiveness and in love. Stopping a war just makes it boil. Approaching peace that way may develop worse, a worse situation in the end, because all they're doing is reloading and becoming fortified better for the next time. The peace of the Bible never evades issues. The peace of the Bible is not at any price. It's not a gloss. The peace of the Bible conquers the problem. It builds a bridge. It, sometimes it's, it, it means struggle. Sometimes it, it, it means pain. Sometimes it means anguish. You know That's why it's so hard to go to someone when there's a relationship broken, even in the church, isn't it? because of the struggle, because of the pain, because of the anguish involved. So we don't. Anyway. Biblical peace is real peace. James 3.17 says, but the wisdom from above is first pure, and and then it's peaceable. Peace is never sought at the expense of righteousness. You can't divorce, you can't divorce peace from righteousness. God's peace is the presence of righteousness. That's the first meaning of peace. God's peace is also, it's also number two, it is also the possession of purity. God's purity. You have not made peace between two people unless they have seen the sin, the error, the wrongness of the bitterness and hatred, and then they have resolved to bring it before God. I don't know about you, but when I've encouraged two people to come together that were believers, and they realized that their problem was ultimately sinning, didn't matter who did what, the ultimate result was sinning. And when they both confessed before God, I'll tell you what, it's the beginning of reconciliation, of coming back together. But it involves not only righteousness, but purity. Then peace comes through purity when, when they recognize their sin before a holy God. Hebrews 12, 14 says, Pursue peace with, peace with all men, and the sanctification without which no one will see God. Remember last week? Remember what our last beatitude was? In the sanctification process, that means to be becoming separated from sin unto God. You can't divorce peace from righteousness. You can't divorce peace from purity. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. 
Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. What a beautiful expression from the Psalms. Psalm 85.10. The meaning of God's peace is the presence of righteousness. It's also the possession of purity. But thirdly, as you have on your, on your notes, the meaning of righteousness is also the proclamation of truth. I couldn't help but to smile this morning in Sunday school as David was talking about presenting truth. Even if it hurts, you've got to tell the truth. When you see a wrong, you've got to bring it up. Oh, I know they're going to be upset with me. I know it's not going to, they're not going to feel right. I know that I don't, I don't feel that I'm in the position. I'm not right all the time, so I shouldn't even bring it up. Get all these ideas. But truth, biblically speaking, where there is true peace, there is righteousness, holiness, there is purity, and you're presenting it, you're proclaiming it in truth. We all want to avoid needless strife, right? (laughs) Whether it's at home, at, at school, at work, Nobody likes to, well, once in a while you get somebody who's just an agitator. I understand that. But that's not what I'm, that's not what I'm talking about. Our goal as Christians is not to be agitators, but I want to tell you there is an area in our life that we need to contend for the faith. We need to be contentious sometimes as Christians. Because that's, we got to proclaim the truth. You can't sit still and listen to lie after lie after lie and without standing up and saying, you know what, somebody's got to stop and say the truth. We, we need, the, the truth needs to be proclaimed. Amen? It's so important. How you go about it is very important, too. That's what this whole series is going to be about, how to proclaim the truth. So as much as we would love to avoid it, if, if we avoid it to the point of sacrificing truth, we've compromised our principles. And we don't, have, we don't have peace at all then. We have a truce. We have a ceasefire. We have, we have a, peace, a peace treaty, like a cold war. And what have those things been? They've been times to reload. That's all it is, folks. And that's the world that we live in. That's the kind of peace that we um, look at, hoping that nobody gets upset and starts firing back again. God didn't start this war. I've had so many people say to me, oh, you share with Christ with them, well, if God's in control, then why is, he, why is he starting these, why is he letting these, why is these wars going on? God didn't start the war, folks. Satan and man did. Our Lord said in Matthew 10, 34, do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Have you ever read that verse? No, I don't want to talk about that verse. I don't, I don't, I don't understand that verse. I don't, Jesus is love, and Jesus is peace, and Jesus is forgiveness, and, and Jesus doesn't want any strife, and Jesus does, he wants everybody to get along. That verse, when you read that verse alone, in light of what we just read is, as the peacemaker that Jesus is proclaiming in in, in Matthew 5, 9, it appears to be diametrically opposed to that beatitude. How can Jesus contradict himself? He's not. He doesn't contradict himself. He never has, never will. What Jesus means is that he did not come to bring peace at any price. He knew that there had to be strife before there could be peace. Jesus knows us better than he knows than we know ourselves. We often see this when preaching the gospel. 
preaching the truth has to get people mad sometimes before they can be glad. The truth has to upset them before it can make them better. The truth has to make them feel bad because before it can actually make them feel better, feel good. Now, if God is in your gospel presentation, it is actually the Holy Spirit who does that. Amen? Are you with me? Because if you march out of here this morning and say, that's it, I'm going to let them have it. Where is that coming from? The Spirit or your flesh? Because the flesh gets in the way. And when the flesh gets in the way, oh my goodness, we say the wrong things. But when you allow the Spirit of God to work in you and through you, living out the blessed kingdom life that only God can do through you, then the Holy Spirit's going to do the convicting. Amen? The Holy Spirit is the one that convicts anyway. Not you. And when that happens, you are used to bring truth which results in God's peace to the world. First the sword falls and, and out of the sword can come peace because, because it's the sword of purity. It's the sword of righteousness. It's the sword of holiness. The sword of truth. The word of God. See, the beautiful thing about letting the Spirit of God use the Word of God is when somebody gets mad at you, you could say, well, you said, I said, you just say, no, I didn't say it, God said it. Here's what God says. Point it to them right in the Word, show people what God said. And then when they get mad, you can say, well, get mad at me if you want, but I'm just showing you the truth. I'm showing you what God says. And God is truth. If you want to get mad, get mad at him. That doesn't work anyway. They can still get mad at you, amen? Yeah. Jude, verse 3, supports this when he says, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about your common salvation, the writer, Jude, says, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend for the faith. Contend for the faith. I'm telling you. which was once delivered to the saints. In other words, you're losing your faith, believer. And then Jude, because of the truth, said, i got to tell you the truth. And sometimes we have to do that when we're sharing with somebody. We have to be contentious about some things. So we bring the gospel to bear, and, and sometimes when we do that, it ruffles feathers, doesn't it? It convicts, and it brings contention and strife. Yeah, the gospel message, the true message. But when, but when the conflict is resolved, when it's resolved by faith in Jesus Christ, it, it brings real peace. Amen? It did to each one of you when you trusted Christ as Savior. Especially if you were older when you made that decision. Anyway, when the conflict's over, we have real peace. We are not abandoning doctrine or conviction. We are not to avoid bringing up the truth just because it offends somebody. On the contrary, we must bring it up because sometimes people need to be offended. They need to realize that they're offending a holy God. Because we live in a world that says, oh, no, we have our own understanding of God. I heard two weeks ago talking to a, an individual from a different denomination, and they said they had a, a, a guest speaker. It was a, a lady preacher, and the lady preacher was sharing about the, the, the loaves and the fishes. And after the sermon, when they, she was uh, and leaving, Someone commented to her and said, wow, that's quite a miracle that Jesus could feed all those people. With, And he, she said, well, Jesus exaggerated a little bit in, this, in, the, in his messages. He exaggerates. 
That's how she explained the miracle. An exaggeration. Now, I'm not coming down on anybody, but this is the world that we live in, and we need to stand up for what the truth is, and God's word is truth. The, we, we, we can't back down from that. To deal with truth, sometimes in your, in your presentation, you're going to be a divider. You're going to be a disruptor. You're going to be a disturber of the years that are hearing you. So don't be surprised. Divides, it disturbs, it, it disrupts the hearts that you're speaking to. I can't help but to remember what Wiersbe said. Wiersbe said the heart of every problem is what? The problem in every, in every heart. And the problem is sin. Nobody likes to talk about sin. But there's no other way around it. We have all tried to live for Christ and give a testimony. All of a sudden, there you are trying to be a peacemaker. You're trying to bring peace to someone, helping people make peace with God, maybe in the workplace, maybe at school, maybe, maybe in the home, maybe you're being, maybe it's a loved one. You want to make peace with God and each other and, and, in, and in their hearts, and, and all they do is get angry at you because they don't like what they're hearing. The whole premise of your message is that, that they have to deal with sin. And people don't like to hear that, do they? Amen? Uh, what? Amen? People don't like to hear about sin. They get angry with you. That's, I guess, typical. They don't like to hear the truth. Some people can't handle the truth. You remember that saying? That phrase? Remember where that came from? Remember the movie, A Few Good Men? That phrase was spoken by the character, Colonel Jessup, played by Jack Nicholson. Oh, he did a good job. Oh. Tom Cruise was the smart, smarty act, you know, young lawyer, all this business. Now listen, in that movie, the colonel was standing on conviction. He had his marine code that he called his conviction. The problem with that illustration is that Colonel Jessup was wrong. He was wrong for what he was standing for because, you know, if you saw the movie. But I want to bring something that's so important. What he said was, was correct. People can't handle the truth. And when it comes to sin, nobody likes to hear that. Especially if two are fighting and one is wrong the other, and then the result is now both of them are mad and both of them are sinning. But the one who's the defendant doesn't want to hear that at all. Amen? So we bring it home. What I want you to draw from that illustration is not some arrogant, narrow-minded colonel who has his own cause and his own thing. What I want you to get from that is that you need to stand fast on the conviction that God gives you. And that is that you need to proclaim the truth, no matter what, even if they can't handle the truth. Are you with me? I hope I un you understand that, because... While we, we could call a truce during a situation, we're not helping the individual make peace with God. I love God and, and his creation too much to not speak the truth. Did you get that statement? The reason I'm telling the truth is because I love God more the most, and I love you as my neighbor not to tell you the truth. I've got to tell you the truth, even if it hurts, even if you get mad at me. I'm going to tell you the truth. You know what? That's a biblical peacemaker. 
Biblical peacemakers are not quiet. They're not easygoing. The people who just want to make no waves or no issues, who lack justice and sense of righteousness, who are compromisers and appeasers. People say, oh, he's, he's such a peacemaker when he, when they really, you know what they really mean is, that, oh, he doesn't have any conviction. He's not a peacemaker. He's a peacekeeper. And there's a big difference between a peacemaker and a peacekeeper. And guess what? We're out of time. So I can't go into that, but you will get it in a later message, okay? There's a difference. Because we're done. We're done with the message here. We'll talk later about that. A true biblical peacemaker will not let sleeping dogs lie. They will not allow the elephant in the room, so to speak, or they will not save the status quo he doesn't say, I know the person's doing wrong, but I would rather just have peace, a peaceful situation. I just want to keep the peace. I want to tell you folks, that's a cop-out. It's a cop-out because God wants us to be peacemakers, not peacekeepers. So that's the meaning of peace. The meaning of peace is resolving conflict by truth, by the truth you bring to bear in righteousness and purity. Father in heaven, I thank you for the word. I pray that you, Lord, as we introduce this next beatitude, the seventh one, we realize, Lord, that, that it all builds on the first six beatitudes. Because if the first six are not in place, huh, you can't be a peacemaker. So I thank you, Father, how you use this Sermon on the Mount. I pray that you'll bless. I pray that we will be able to um, chew on the very things that were shared this morning, that we can meditate on them, that we can pray about it, that we can understand, learn what the meaning of peace, God's peace, is all about. So that we can be that agent for you, that we can be that peacemaker, that we can be happy and be called the sons of God. Thank you, Father. Pray that you'll help us to be an encouragement. Father, as we look to the future here, we got the Easter uh, Resurrection Sunday coming up in a couple weeks, so we'll have a theme next week and the next for Resurrection Sunday. And we'll break from this series until after. But God, as we wait, help us to meditate on what a peacemaker is. And Lord, if there's one here that doesn't have peace with you, that maybe they realize that they need to have peace with God so that they can have the peace of God. And I pray, Father, that you would work in their hearts, and if they need to make that decision, the decision would be, Jesus, I love you. I am so sorry that I've sinned, and I realize now that my sin is keeping me from you. You died for me, you rose from the grave, you paid the price for my sin, and I believe you, and I'm trusting you. Forgive me of my sin and give me eternal life. And for the believer, Lord, challenge us to be the peacemaker that you've called us to be, the agent, as we live the blessed kingdom life. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing as we close out our service. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to
Savior, I come to Thee. We certainly need you every hour. We need you every minute, every second. The scripture says without you, Jesus, we can do nothing. And, and being a peacemaker definitely is a challenge. It's, such a, it's something that we can't do. It, it's a supernatural power that needs to take over. And God, I pray that you'll challenge us, Lord, as we, as we see the day approaching, that you would help us to, to live the blessed kingdom life so that the world could see your good works and glorify you and your Father in heaven. Thank you, Father, for what you're going to accomplish. Prepare our hearts, Lord, even for Easter and, and the resurrection coming up and uh, the celebration that we have there. And Lord, we just thank you for the challenge today. In Jesus' name. And God's people said...